Howdy, everyone. How are you all doing today? <clears throat> I hear you. I briefly thought today was Friday and, and got a little excited when I woke up and then just now realized it was Thursday. <laughs> but I'll survive. Why are you like this? There we go. <clears throat> Okay, um, so, <clears throat> so as I mentioned before, um, we have another exam next week on Tuesday again, same process, uh, same time slots, um, everything should be the same as the last exam. Um, so similarly, uh, Monday is going to be a review session. <clears throat> and um, after class, instead of doing office hours, I'm going to do a review session for a couple hours or so, uh, or just sort of continue the review session after class. Um, <clears throat> and I will upload that to YouTube uh, if you're not able to stay after. And, um, and I'm mostly just going to go through <clears throat> and uh, working through some problems people are having trouble with. Speaking of which, um, so we, we just got the practice problems. I am uploading them as we speak. Hang on, let me make sure. Yes, okay, cool. Uh, and they are now. Um, Yeah, they're now under the exam two review questions. Right, so they're they're in Canvas now, under files, in the subfolder, exam review questions. In fact, let me, yeah, yep, yep, yep. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I will um, write down uh, solutions to these, and I will um, I will try to get those up Friday, Saturday, probably sometime by Saturday. Um, but yeah, so there there are those ones. That's that's what you want to look at first. Um, if you power through those, you get all those done. There are going to be some um, <clears throat> questions on. Uh, the 230 website that you could do also, uh, and you'd want to look at the the, uh, the questions from exams three and four <clears throat> on there. Um, so this exam is going to cover everything in chapter 14. So starting with uh, functions of several variables, and then going all the way to what we're talking about today and tomorrow, uh, Lagrange multipliers. Um, any questions? Also, I'm not going to do what I did last week and uh, push the due dates of the, the homeworks for the past, the last section in this section uh, ahead of the exam. Um, I'm just gonna have those due the usual week after we're done talking about them. So if you, um, if you would like to do those before the exam, that is fine. Uh, I would suggest doing the um, practice problems first the exam review questions first. Um, but if you got some time, then it's it's decent practice to do those. But the exam review questions are going to be sort of more targeted towards the 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 material you're going to see on the exam. But yeah, any any other questions? Ookly dokly. All right. So <clears throat> Yeah, uh, I was a little disappointed that there were no solutions um, last time. That really, it, 
is only slightly helpful <laughs> if if you if you can't actually see how how everything's done. So, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, alrighty. So today we're going to talk about using Lagrange multipliers. Um, to do what's called constrained optimization. Okay, so previous semesters I usually <clears throat> go through and talk about um, how Lagrange multipliers work, where the formula comes from, but um, I think that's usually in one ear out the other. And if you want to learn it, it's in the book. Um, so I'm just going to skip that whole thing. And I'm going to talk about what constrained optimization is. And then I'm going to just give you uh, the process uh, using Lagrange multipliers. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to do some examples. Uh, if you want to see uh, where that formula comes from, where those formulas come from, um, it's explained in the book. But uh, not going to use precious class time. Okay, so um, Lagrange multipliers are a, a method of, of optimizing a function subject to a constraint. So here's sort of the idea there. And here's sort of an example, which we'll solve in a sec, um, that shows where this comes from. So suppose I said, what is the maximum volume of an open top box. Suppose all I said was, what is the max volume of an open top box, right? So an open top box right? So here's my beautiful box. Suppose you have all the sides on here, except the top, right? The top is just open, right? There's no material. Let's say you make it out of cardboard. There's no material on top, but all the other sides. Um, are there. So what's the maximum volume of an open top box? Well, that's a stupid question, right? I can literally make this as big as I want. Um, <clears throat> if I don't give any more information, right, there's no limit to how big an open top box I can make. There is no maximum. But suppose I also say, Suppose I give it extra bit of information, which um, constrains the possible dimensions of our box. So to be made from, say, 10 square feet of cardboard. <clears throat> okay, so I have a thing I want to maximize. And we're going to turn that into a function, as we'll see. So we want to maximize this function. So just maximizing the function is, uh, as it, this function in particular, there's, there's literally no max if you don't give any more information. But if I say uh, you only have 10 square feet of cardboard to work with, <clears throat> that's a constraint that limits the dimensions possible for this box. And it turns out that there is going to be a max volume subject to that constraint. <clears throat> so 
So in this case, we would say, okay, so here's here's how we would set this up mathematically. So here's our box. Let's let's put it in space. Put one of the corners at the origin, <clears throat> and uh, let's calculate the volume by letting the length, width, and height be x, y, and z, right? So our length, or so the the distance we go in the x direction is going to be x. The distance we go in the y direction, it's going to be y. Oh, wait. Whoops. And the height of the box is going to be z. So. What's what's the volume of this open top box in terms of x, y, and z? It's x times y times z, length, width, height, right? So now we have a function um, that we want to maximize. But, oops, we're not allowed to choose literally any x, y, and z we want. <clears throat> we can only choose the x, y, and z um, where the amount of cardboard we use is um, at most 10 square feet. So technically, we could use less than 10 square feet of cardboard. Um, if we wanted, but if you think about it for two seconds, right? Um, the the biggest box you can make is going to be using all of the cardboard you're allowed to use. So let's just assume we're using ten square feet of cardboard. Well, how this is an open top box? How do we write um, the amount of cardboard used in constructing this in terms of x, y, and z? Well, that's just going to be the surface area of the box, right? So we just add up the area of each of the faces and set that equal to 10. And that's, um, whoops, that's going to be what we call our constraint equation. That tells us what x, y, and z we're allowed to use. So what is the surface area? So suppose the top. Is, is, is missing. There's no cardboard on top, but all the other sides have cardboard. What's the surface area? Well, if we do the left and right faces, what is, what is the area of the left face? X times Z. So the left and right faces are identical. They're both there. Um, so it's two XZ. That takes care of, let me give myself a little bit of room here, actually. That takes care of the left face and right face. How about the front and back faces? Well, those are both um, x times y. No, sorry, uh, 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 y times z. And how about, um, well, the top face is, is missing. There's no cardboard there, but the bottom face is uh, x times y. So that's our surface area. And it has to be equal to 10. So you know what? Actually, let me do this. So this is going to be the constraint equation. So we're going to call. This function, which gives us a surface area, our, our g of x, y, z. So if I um, ignore the, 
question now and just look at this mathematically. We want to find the max value of the function x, y, z subject to the constraint g of x, y, z, which is 2x, z plus 2y, z plus x, y equals 10. So that is our constraint equation. And I want to emphasize the way you want to think about this is the constraint equation tells you. So the constraint equation, if you graph this 2xz plus 2yz plus xy equals 10, that's going to be a surface, right? And that surface um, tells you the possible values, uh, the possible points x, y, z we can consider, right? So that gives us the dimensions we're allowed to consider when we're maximizing our function f of x, y, z. So in general, we're going to use Lagrange to solve problems of the form We want to find the max and or the min. It may happen that either the max or the min doesn't doesn't occur sometimes. So that's a possibility. So find the max and or min. And let me just say, uh, find the extreme values of some function f of x, y, z. It can also be a function of two variables. We'll do an example of that, uh, possibly today. If not today, then definitely tomorrow. So we need to maximize a function subject to the constraint g of x, y, z equals k. Exactly the same. <laughs> so you want to maximize some function, and then we have uh, some equation telling us what points x, y, and z we're actually maximizing our function on. So we're not considering all points x, y, z. We're only considering the points on the surface g x, y, z equals k. So that tells us the set of points we're allowed to look at. So the way we're going to do this, <clears throat> and once again, if you want to see where this comes from, you can look at the book. So if we want to find the extreme values of f x, y, z subject to some constraint, here's what we do. <clears throat> we are going to. Find the x, y, z, and lambda. So lambda is going to be called our Lagrange multiplier. <clears throat> Satisfying the following equations. So it satisfies the gradient of f at x, y, z is equal to lambda times the gradient of g at x, y, z. So the gradient of f is some scalar multiple of the gradient of g at this point, x, y, z. That scalar multiple is lambda. That's our Lagrange multiplier. <clears throat> and it also needs to satisfy the constraint equation. g of x, y, z equals k. So we're going to maximize the function f of x, y, z subject to the constraint g of x, y, z equals k. The way we're going to do this is we're going to find x, y, z 
so we're going to find the values x, y, z, and lambda, which simultaneously satisfy these two equations. So the x, y, z So the x, y, and z are going to give us points. So we need to find values of x, y, and z, which satisfy all three of these together, right? And those are going to give us points. We'll do some examples of this. Um, the lambda is usually we don't actually uh, solve for lambda explicitly. I'll just mention that. Oh, sorry, let me let me say this. Usually don't we usually don't try to find explicit values of lambda. Um, but we do, we do have to consider, we'll, we'll see when we do some examples, but it's the X, Y, and Z that we care about. So those points, X, Y, and Z, those are going to be, um, possible places where our max and our min occur. So we're going to check the value of our function at each of those points that we got. Okay. So we're going to check uh, fun our function at each of those points. The biggest value is the max, the smallest is min. So we get a set of points by solving for x, y, and z from these equations and lambda. We check our function at each of these points. <clears throat> the biggest value we get is the max. The smallest value we get is the min. And that's the process. OK, so. Um, one thing that might <clears throat> jump out at you is uh, we have two equations here, but four unknowns. And it seems a little weird that we would be able to solve for those four unknowns from just two equations. Turns out it's actually not just two equations. Also, let me emphasize, so this is for functions of three variables. If we want to maximize a function of three variables subject to a constraint, where Constraint equation involves three variables. We can all do also do this for functions of two variables. The exact same thing is true, right? So if it's just a function of x and y, we need to find x, y, and lambda. Now z is no longer involved, satisfying the um, <clears throat> the gradient of f at x, y is equal to lambda times the gradient of g at x, y, and g of x, y equals k. So like the same formula or, or equations uh, work for functions of two variables. OK, so it turns out we actually do have four equations here. Because this one equation here is actually, so uh, the gradient of f is a vector, right? So it's a vector each of whose entries are functions. So the gradient of f is f sub x at x, y, z, f sub y at x, y, z, f sub z at x, y, z, and lambda times the gradient of g 
is, whoops, sorry, no, that's the gradient of G. Gradient of G is uh, G sub X at X, Y, Z, G sub Y, G sub Z. And we could just bring that lambda in. So lambda G sub X, lambda G sub Y, lambda G sub D. <clears throat> and so if we have uh, two vectors equal to each other, that means each of their entries are equal to each other. So we have F sub X is equal to lambda G sub X, F sub Y is lambda G sub Y, and F sub Z is lambda G sub Z. So this one equation is actually these three equations here. And these are the equations you should be writing down. So we need x, y, and z, x, y, z, and lambda satisfying these three equations. And in addition, the constraint equation, g of x, y, z equals k. <clears throat> So these are your equations we're going to work with. Let's do some examples, because that's really the only way you can get the hang of, of this stuff. <clears throat> OK. So let's do the example we started off with. We want to find the max volume of an open top box to be made with 10 square feet of cardboard. <clears throat> okay, so we already, um, we already, so often you'll have, you'll have word problems like this, uh, where there's like no equations to be found, no functions. And you need to translate that into, uh, you need to, from this, find a function that needs to be maximized and also um, a constraint equation. So we already determined we want to find the max. of the function f of x, y, z, which is just x times y times z. Subject to the surface area, which we said was 2xz plus 2yz oops, plus xy is 10. So we're using 10 square feet of cardboard. <clears throat> so we have the function we want to maximize, x, y, z, and the constraint equation, 2xz plus 2yz plus xy equals 10. For that 2xz, 2yz, that whole thing, can that change, or is that always, is that kind of just the way that's set up, like a surface area? Um, like, what do you mean by? by change like you can call the variables you can like switch x y and z if you like so we could say uh suppose um uh so suppose the the side that's missing is not the top but like say the front or something like that in which case so the front um would the area of that would be um would be oh wait i see now yeah because that's yeah that's all surface area and, and like the top of the box is not covered 
correct. Is that why? Right. But literally all you're doing in that case is like rotating your box. And so you're going to call X, Y, and Z different things, but you're going to end up with the same answer. Ah, okay. Perfect. So yeah, what we actually call the variables is, is not important. We're going to end up with the same answer in the end. <clears throat> okay. All right. So what we're going to do is uh, we need to solve the following. Okay. So f sub x is equal to lambda times g sub x. f sub y is equal to lambda times g sub y. f sub z is equal to lambda times g sub z. And then it also has to satisfy the x, y, z has to satisfy our constraint equation. It has to lie on the surface described by this equation. So 2xz plus 2yz plus xy equals 10. <clears throat> so I left some room there. Um, once you get the hang of this, you, you won't need to write down f sub x equals lambda g sub x. You'll just write down what the partial of f with respect to is equals lambda times what the partial of f with respect or g with respect to x is, et cetera. Um, but this is just. to emphasize uh, the equations we're using. OK, so what's the f is uh, x, y, z. What's the partial of that with respect to x? Just the fx portion, it should just be y, z. Right. And what is the, so lambda, what is the partial of g? with respect to x? Should be lambda times two, lambda, lambda parenthesis two z plus y. Uh, yeah, so two z plus two y. Oh, two y, yeah. Yeah. Or oh, sorry, no, sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, sorry, two z plus, no, you're absolutely right. Two z plus y. Sorry, I was getting ahead of myself there. Okay. And then we do the same for f sub y and lambda g sub y. So f sub y is xz times is equal to lambda, and g sub y is 2z plus x. And then that's yz. Uh, f sub z is xy, and that's equal to lambda times g sub z, which is 2x plus 2y. <clears throat> OK, so these are the equations we're working with. We need to find x, y, z, and lambda satisfying these all simultaneously. So there is no one way to do this. There's like no one method that works for every single problem. Um, <clears throat> but there are um, a, a few methods which, which tend to work for certain types of problems. And as you do a number of these, um, you'll start to pick up on patterns and, and see different ways of doing things. So this is going to illustrate one um, kind of smart way to do this. So here's, here's how we're going to do this one. OK, let me also emphasize, um, let's just get in the habit of doing the following. So I, I said we don't explicitly solve for lambda. Usually. Sometimes it helps, but usually we don't. But there is one weird case which can happen sometimes, which tends to be different from everything else. 
So I'm going to say always check whether lambda equals 0 is possible. That almost always, uh, so there are, it's not that common, but there are some problems where lambda equals zero is possible. And doing that is you're almost always going to miss those values of x, y, and z <clears throat> if you don't explicitly consider lambda equals zero. It's very easy to miss those points x, y, z. So that should be like sort of the first thing you do is rule out whether um, lambda equals zero is possible. If it's not possible, fine, we'll assume lambda is non-zero and then move on. If it is possible, find the x, y, and z corresponding to that. So that's, um, let me just say, do this first for every problem. You can usually do it quickly. Usually it's not possible and you can rule it out pretty quickly. <clears throat> okay, so lambda equals zero. So what happens if lambda equals zero? So if lambda is equal to 0, then going through our equations, yz equals 0. xz is equal to 0. And xy is also equal to 0. That's what our first three equations become. <clears throat> So if x, uh, yz is equal to 0, xz is equal to 0, xy is equal to 0, if we plug those, if we take that info and then go to our constraint equation, can we satisfy the constraint equation? What happens? Right, you get uh, 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals 10. <clears throat> Which you, you can't possibly satisfy the constraint equation for any value of x, y, and z. So. My. Good. Okay. So we get lambda equals zero. Can't happen. <clears throat> so we don't need to, we can now just uh, suppose lambda is not zero and move on with our lives. <clears throat> and then kind of forget about what lambda actually is. But I want to emphasize that always check lambda equals zero. And the way you're usually going to do that is you plug that into your equations. You see that what that tells you about x, y, and z. And you plug that info into the constraint equation and see if it's possible to find an x, y, and z satisfying the constraint equation there. Usually it's not possible. Sometimes it is. We've had ex uh, final exams in the past or, or uh, midterms in the past where um, lambda equals zero was possible and almost everyone missed it. So be careful, always check that. Usually it's pretty quick. Okay. So now we can assume whatever lambda is, who cares? It's not equal to zero. So we have yz is equal to lambda 2y plus z. xz is lambda 2, oh, uh, nope, sorry, 2z plus y. 
2z plus x. And then we have xy is lambda 2x plus 2y. And then we also have our constraint equation 2xz plus 2yz plus xy equals 10. So these are our equations. All right. So there are different ways of doing this, but there's one really simple way. Notice on for the first three equations, <clears throat> the left-hand side, if we multiply um, the left-hand side by certain things in each equation, we can get the left-hand side equal for all these guys. So uh, yz, if I multiply that by x, I get xyz. Xz, if I multiply that by y, I get xyz. Xy, if I multiply that by z, I get xyz. <clears throat> so I'm going to get the left-hand sides all equal to each other, and then see set the right-hand sides equal to each other. So I'm going to multiply both sides by x for the first equation. x, y, z, multiply both sides by x. Second equation, I'm going to multiply both sides by y. Third equation, I'm going to multiply both sides by z. <clears throat> so I'm going to distribute that x through. So I get 2 xz plus xy, lambda 2, oops yz plus xy. And then the third becomes uh, 2 xz plus, whoops, sorry, no. 2xz plus 2xy. OK. So now we have the same thing on the left-hand side for each of these equations. <clears throat> x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z. So now we can set the right-hand sides equal to each other. And we'll do this pair by pair. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to get a relationship between x, y, and z. We had to do something um, smart to get to this point. But this is one of the one of the common ways of solving these is getting relationship, uh, writing all the variables in terms of one variable, and then plugging that info into the constraint equation and then solving for that one variable. So let's see what this tells us. So we have lambda times 2xz plus xy equals lambda times 2yz plus xy. Let me do this down here. Shouldn't the last equation be lambda 2xz plus 2yz? Um, the last equation, yes, it should be. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yep, you're right. You're right. Spaced out, 2yz. Yep, correct. So we get lambda uh, setting the, the first two equal. So we get lambda 2xz equals uh, plus xy is equal to lambda 2yz plus xy. OK. So we're assuming lambda is not equal to 0. And so um, we're allowed to divide both sides by lambda. And when we do that, we can cancel out the lambda. So now we have 2xz plus xy equals 2yz plus xy. Well, we have xy on both of these, so we can just subtract that from both sides. So 2xz equals 2yz. <clears throat> can divide both sides by 2. So xz equals yz. OK. so. We'd like to say this means x equals y. But it could be that z equals 0 in this case. If z is equal to 0, 
um, then that means uh, X and, and Y could be literally anything. And that doesn't help us. So <clears throat> luckily, Z is not going to be 0. Because what happens if Z is 0? What's the volume of our box? It's 0. Right. So obviously, that's not the max volume. <clears throat> Obviously not the max. So it's safe to assume Z is not zero. <clears throat> so this means whatever our dimensions are, whatever X and Y are, they're equal to each other. We don't know what they are yet. We know they're equal. <clears throat> OK, so then now we're going to consider uh, the second two equations. We're going to consider the second two together. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to use the fact that we know x equals y. Oops. Okay, so the second two equations say, <clears throat> um, I'm going to skip the whole bit. Um, we know we can divide by lambda. So we have 2yz plus xy equals 2xz plus 2yz. But we know x is equal to y. Hang on, let me. So when we put that in, I'm going to replace um, x with y. So we get 2yz <clears throat> plus um, x squared. Sorry, y squared. We're replacing x with y. Equals 2 yz, replacing x with y, plus 2yz. <clears throat> so we can subtract the 2yz from both sides. So we know y squared is equal to 2yz. <clears throat> we would like to divide both sides by lambda to say y is equal to 2z. And for the same reason, we know if y is 0, that means our volume is 0. So. So we know y is not equal to 0. So we divide both sides by y, and we get y is equal to 2z. <clears throat> or, um, yeah. OK. So what we're going to do is we have x equals y, and y is equal to 2z. <clears throat> so. Let me write that over here. And so we want to write x uh, all. We want to write two of the variables in terms of, of just one. So since x is equal to y, we know x is also equal to 2z. So now we've written x in terms of z, y in terms of z. So now, this is basically, at this point, this is how all the problems go. You get some relationship uh, from the first three equations, and you use that relationship um, <clears throat> and plug it into the third equation, uh, the, the constraint equation. So when we do that, Sorry, let me let me write down the constraint again. Sorry. Um, so we got 
2, nope, 2xz plus 2yz plus xy equals 10. Plugging this in, replacing uh, y with 2z and x with 2z, we get 4z squared plus, so a 2 times 2z times z is 4z squared. 2 times 2z times z is 4z squared also, because y is 2z. Plus um, xy, so x is 2z, y is 2z. It's also 4z squared. Probably should have done equal to 12 for a nice number, but that's OK. So we get uh, 12z squared equals 10. Z squared is equal to 10 over 12, which is 5 over 6. So if I'm just looking at this mathematically and I forget about the fact that um, that we're talking about volume and length here, I would say z is equal to plus or minus square root 5 over 6. But since I know I'm talking about length, x, y, and z all, all have to be positive because right, length is, is always greater than or equal to 0. So we're only taking the positive one. in this case, because z is length. So we know z, the max happens where z is equal to square root 5 over 6. Oops. <clears throat> so that's where the max happens. Um, and we know x is equal to 2 times z, and y is equal to 2 times z. So the point we get is uh, x is uh, 2 square root 5 over 6, y is 2 square root 5 over 6, z is square root 5 over 6. So plugging that into volume, oops, we get 2 times 2. times uh, square root 5 over 6 times square root 5 over 6 is just 5 over 6 times square root 5 over 6. So we get 20 over 6, which is 10 over 3. And this is the max volume. Wait, I'm sorry. Where did the two come from in front of the square root five over six? Um. So oh. I know. Uh, so we we solve for z by um, using the relationship we found from the first three equations and getting x and y in terms of z and plugging it into the constraint equation. So we we use that to solve for z. We found z is square root five over six. So we also we still know. The relationship between x and z and y and z. We know x is equal to 2 times z, y is equal to 2 times z. And so x is equal to 2 times square root 5 over 6, and y is equal to 2 times square root 5 over 6. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay, so a lot happened here, but it boils down to we set up our four equations here, you get three if it was a function of two variables, but we get four because it's a function of three variables. 
f sub x is lambda g sub x, f sub y is lambda g sub y, f sub z is lambda g sub z, and the constraint equation, g of x, y, z equals 10. OK. So we, we usually, we're going to focus on the first three equations. Um, in this case, what we did was we found a way to get the left-hand sides all equal to each other by multiplying everything by both sides by certain things in each equation. We set the right-hand sides equal to each other. We got some relationship between x, y, and z. So we solved for uh, two variables, x and y, in terms of z. And we use that relationship to plug into the constraint equation to solve for that one variable, z. That's what we did here. Once we solve for z, we use the relationship we already know between x and z and y and z. That gives us a point, 2 root 5 over 6, 2 root 5 over 6, root 5 over 6. We plug that into our function, and then that is going to give us the max volume. Since we only get one point here, we know what's going to be the max. That happens sometimes. So we'll do uh, a few more of these uh, next time. But any any other any other questions? What would have happened if uh, the lambda could have been equal to zero? Um, so you you would have to I would have to kind of explain where these equations come from. Um, it's a little it's a little difficult to do. Uh, yeah, it's a little difficult to do that in a reasonable amount of time. But suffice it to say, you have to check lambda equals zero because um, like the way you're going to find x, y, and z is going to be very different for the case of lambda equals zero than lambda is, is non-zero. Um, and so you, that's a thing that you just have to check separately. Almost always, you're not going to be able to have lambda equals zero, but you do. Uh, you do need to check it because sometimes, sometimes you can, and you're gonna 100% miss the X, Y, and Z where it happens um, if you didn't check it explicitly. That's that's all I'll say for now. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. We'll we'll resume this um, tomorrow. Um, have a good rest of your Thursday, and I will see y'all later. And I'm going over the office hour Zoom right now.